welcome to Newton's Macabre Tales. To find more free short stories, visit www.newtonweb.com with two Bs. The Tattoo by Newton Webb 2nd of February, 2022, on the A41, Hertfordshire. Elsie stood with her thumb out in the biting wind. There was blood on her face, and her clothes were coated with grime. Pulling her oversized suit jacket tighter, she swore as cars screamed by in mute ignorance. Finally, a lorry came by and slowed. She breathed a sigh of relief, opening the cab door and clambering aboard. The driver looked down at her and patted the seat beside him. She smiled sweetly and slid onto it. He grinned. I ain't never picked up a girl as pretty as you before. She looked straight ahead. I appreciate the lift. She avoided his gaze and focused on the road. She didn't twitch a muscle when his hand slid over onto her jeans. They remained like this for a while until he broke the silence to ask. So, you in trouble? Because I can look after you. No, I'm, I'm in no trouble she said. He laughed. Good! As he reached down and squeezed her thigh. She turned to him and looked straight at his face. Do you like stories? He blinked at the abrupt change in direction and listened as she narrated her tale. A man walked into a bar. His bald head gleamed with sweat. His breath was ragged. A tailored suit gripped his pudgy form. A woman looked up from the bar. We're shut. Everyone's gone home. The man strode up to the counter. You haven't. And he thudded a fifty-pound note down. Double agavulin, sixteen, no ice. He took off his tiny circular glasses as sweat rolled down his face. We don't serve alcohol after eleven, mister. He pointed to a sign which stated that the bar closed at midnight. Keep the change. She swore under her breath, swiped the fifty, and started searching for a bottle of Lagavulin. Eventually she found one, and free poured a large whiskey. You here? he asked as he shook off his jacket. He hung it on a Chelsea hook under the bar. She cocked an eyebrow. You could say that. As she went to replace the bottle on the shelf, she changed her mind, returning to pour a large glass for herself. Largest double I've ever seen, now that I'm complaining. She gazed evenly at him, before knocking it back in one slug. Whoa, hold your horses. It's a sipping drink, he laughed. Now, you'll need another one. She looked at him, directly in the eyes, and poured herself another. Walking around the bar to the front door, she clicked the lock shut. He pursed his lips and reached for a handkerchief to mop his brow. I thought you were shut. She smiled. As she walked over, she hoisted herself onto her bar stool. You just won yourself a ticket to the lockdown. She raised her glass and they clinked. My name's Dennis, he offered. The lorry driver waited, then blinked. That's it? My God, that'd be a terrible story, he laughed. Just as well you be so very, very pretty. You won't be getting no job as a writer. He shook his head, saying mockingly, My name is Dennis. What kind of a story ends with that as a punchline? They drove in silence for a while. She could feel the sweat from his clammy palms through her jeans. Okay, so here'll be a story for you. I've heard a few in my time as a lorry driver. We boys do like to banter. He sat back in silence, as if he was savouring the moment. Dave. He was called Dave. A long-haul petrol tanker from Hull. It was a cheeky one, that one. Must have been about twenty years ago now. He had a skinhead and a nose ring. Real L razor. See, he had a lot of tattoos but one of them he'd be really, really proud of. He reached down beside him 
and pulled up a handful of crisps, munching on them noisily. When his feast had subsided, he slapped his shoulder. Big one it was. It be Satan himself, all red and orange, with a goatee and smoking a cigarette. Real classy job it was. Always looked like the devil be looking right at you, mocking you when you saw it. Made me shudder every time. No matter what angle it stood at, it were like the eyes were always watching you. He paused for dramatic effect. See, he be a cheeky one. Used to say he was immortal. Never got hangovers, no matter how long we drank. His secret be that although he professed that his soul belonged to him and him alone, his body belonged to the devil. The devil won't brook no harm to his property, so he said. He glanced over at Elsie and then returned his gaze to the road. We be in a convoy. He be up in his oiler. I be a few lorries back in mine. Then out of the blue, boom, it blew up. He gestured with his hand and made an explosive sound. To fireball, I slammed on my brakes, only just stopped in time. It be so hot, I couldn't approach. It be only after the fire brigade had put out the blaze that I be called in to identify the body. You wouldn't have thought that there'd be anything to identify, and you'd be mostly right. The body be roasted. Third degree burns all over it. Total mess. But the policeman, his face be white, and he be mouthing like a drowning fish. He points at the body and I saw her. Just one part of it be unburnt. His shoulder. That bloody devil be grinning right back at me, surrounded by a patch of flawless skin, flush as a baby's bum. You see, my mate be right. The devil did protect his earthly body, just only the bit that he be living on. Silence filled the cab. The driver burst out laughing. Now that be a story. That be a real story. Look at your face. Oh, your face. Elsie's face had remained impassive throughout the story. He indicated and pulled onto an off-ramp. Where are you going? She asked. He smirked, saying nothing. Where? Where are you going? She repeated. Well, the way I see it is, I be giving you a lift, so I reckon the least you can do is spare me a favour in return. She turned to him. Wait, I missed out the important bit of my story. It's about a tattoo. He sighed theatrically. Nobody cares about your story. He pulled into a lay-by, branches screeching along the sides of the lorry. Oh, it's really good, I promise you. The second half doesn't make sense without the first half. You won't hear a better story for the rest of your life. He sat quietly watching her. Boing, he relented. A girl walked into a bar. The bar was empty apart from a muscular barman, his white vest barely containing his taut musculature. The jukebucks in the corner tried to fill the void with the police, every breath you take. It was a valiant effort, but it just ended up emphasising the emptiness. The barman watched closely as she strutted to the bar. A wry smile dripped from her cherry-red lips. A glass of rosé, please. She looked over at the no-smoking sign and pulled a face, sliding onto one of the bar stalls. The barman winked at her. You here alone? Alone, and I've no plans to change that. Why? She asked, her eyebrow arched. Because that answer just got you a free drink, that's all. He grinned. The barman's face would have been regarded as classically handsome if it hadn't been for the eyes. They were dead, coal suspended in chalk. It's your lucky night. He turned to pour the wine. Out of sight, he dropped a white powder into her drink and stirred until it vanished into the amber-coloured wine. It's a special night for you too, she said. She flicked her hair back and slid her trench coat open, exposing her collarbone. 
A tattoo of a ring impaled by a crucifix stood out prominently. She rifled in her jacket's inside pocket. Oh yeah? And why is that? he asked. He leaned forwards. She pulled out a series of Polaroids and tossed them onto the bar. Because the Order of San Maria Goretti wants to reward your efforts. He looked at the Polaroids blankly for a while, until he recognised the faces of several girls he'd drugged in the past. A growl stuck in his throat, as looking up, he saw her hand flicker, and a stiletto slid through the layers of muscle and cartilage in his throat. She leapt down off the stool, swiftly moving behind the bar, and lowering his twitching body as he tried to pull out the knife. As his body slumped to the ground, he finally succeeded. His wound sprayed her with arterial blood as he exsanguated. She muttered in distaste, taking the long trench coat off and using it to cover up the corpse. Picking up the Polaroids, she scattered them over his body. Next, she grabbed a bar towel to rub her face clean of blood. So how does that relate? He huffed. They be two different, very mediocre stories. He slid his hand further up between her thighs. And you sure and in that tattoo? It had no relevance to the plot. You only added it because my story added to two. She gently covered his hand with hers. Thirty seconds, just thirty seconds, and you'll get the reward that you so richly deserve. That was the beginning of the story. You've heard the middle. Now here is the end. The lorry driver wasn't even listening, as his breath ran hot in anticipation. The girl laughed raucously as Dennis narrated a tale of his last board meeting. Sounds like they deserve that, her eyes twinkling. And you don't think I was too harsh? He asked, swilling the last remnants of the whiskey around in his glass. Not at all. I am, after all, a firm believer in rough justice. God, I wish I wasn't married. I wish I was twenty years younger. He poured another measure from the bottle into each of their glasses, finishing off the bottle. Now, tilt the glass and follow my lead. If you smell the bottom of the glass, you'll get a completely distinct scent from the top of the glass. That's called the low and the high note. She cocked her eyebrow and shrugged. When she raised her glass, she tried what Dennis suggested, and her eyes widened. It smells sweeter at the top. He laughed. She stood up. That whiskey has gone right through me. I'm going to powder my nose. Do not move. As she turned, she called over her shoulder. I mean it, Dennis. Do not move a muscle. The scotch was flowing through him, and he felt warm and happy. Dennis glugged the last of his glass and smacked his lips together with satisfaction. He looked at the empty bottle and made an executive decision. He peeled off two more fifties and put them on the bar, weighing them down with the empty bottle. As he rounded the bar, he encountered the corpse of the bartender. Fuck! He swore. Fuck! As he backed away in a blurred panic, a sharp pain exploded from between his ribs. You should have listened to me, Dennis, she said. I liked you. I really did. But nothing gets in the way of the mission. She extracted her knife from between his third and fourth ribs, where it had gone deep into his heart. Wiping it clean on a bar towel, she looked down at the two dead bodies. A waste. She picked up Dennis's jacket from where it was hanging and wrapped it around her own body. Then she unlocked the door of the bar and stepped outside into the freezing, cleansing cold. The snow crunched underfoot as Detective Davies approached a cordoned-off area. One of the officers peeled off from the crowd of police who were taking, securing, and collecting evidence. What do we have here, then? A young constable pulled out his notebook. 
A middle-aged lorry driver called Frederick Black has been identified visually using his driving license. The cause of death appears to be a single stab wound to the chest. He doesn't appear to have tried to defend himself, so we assume that he knew his attacker. The cabin is littered with Polaroids of dead women. The police are trying to identify them as we speak. He looked up from his notebook to hear the detective cursing. There'll be female victims of rape and murder. This is the third case in as many days matching the same criteria. He looked over to where the traffic was driving past them. I don't doubt the killer has only just begun their spree. Thank you for listening. To get notified every time a new episode is released, please click follow or subscribe and turn on all notifications. If you enjoyed this episode, then please take a moment to rate Newton's Macabre Tales. Reviewing allows the podcast to grow.